Let's look at a couple other interesting periodic tables, and then we will continue our discussion of the table that we use by looking at types of elements. If you go to the World Wide Web and key in alternative periodic tables, you will come up with a variety of tables covering a variety of topics. But in chemistry, you will find some that I, you will find these that I'm listing here, plus many others. You will find these under the Wikipedia Commons, the Wikipedia Encyclopedia. Now this first one that I'm showing you is in the shape of a pyramid. And as you go down the period, and you see the periods becoming increasingly long, you can understand why that would fit nicely into the pyramid shape. Here's another one called the Ring of Periodic Tables. This was developed by Alexander Braun, a, an artist in Toronto in 2009. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? How about this one? This one is called Genet's Left Step Periodic Table. It finds a lot of use, as I understand, in physics. Note the date, 1928. He was, Genet was quite a, an interesting scientist, had, had a variety of interests. Pay particular attention to hydrogen and helium up here in the upper right-hand column. Here you see hydrogen placed, as we place it, over lithium, sodium, potassium, etc. But look at helium being placed over beryllium, magnesium, calcium, rather than being placed with the noble gases. Now here is one by Theodore Benzi that was done in 1964, starting with hydrogen in the very center of the spiral. And as you see, as you increase the length of the periods, that fits well with the fact that the spiral increases. A very, very interesting concept. You should go search the World Wide Web and look at some of these periodic tables, and more are coming out frequently. Let's talk about types of elements. Now, this term relates to the general electron configuration, particularly the placement of the last electron if you think about the electrons coming in one after the other and filling from lowest energy to highest energy. Based on this, there are four types of elements. They are the representative elements, sometimes called the main group elements. There are the noble gases, sometimes referred to as inert elements, but we know that's a misnomer. Why? That's right, the elements actually can, react, can be made to react. The transition elements, and then we have the inner transition elements. Four types of elements. Here are the representative elements. Now, one thing you need to note on the representative elements. If you're using a periodic table numbered with 1a through 8a and 3b through 2b, as I have here. For the representative elements, you will notice that the family number, such as 1a, 2a, 3a, etc., tells you the number of valence electrons of the elements in that particular family. The noble gases. And you know the noble gases have a filled shell. Helium has two, each of the others have eight in that outer shell. The transition elements, the transition elements are filling an incomplete inner shell, one shell removed from the outer shell. They're filling an incomplete inner shell, one shell removed from the outer shell. Remember you fill the S, then you fill the P, and then you go back and fill the D. And then of course these are the inner transition elements. The inner transition elements are filling a shell two shells removed from the outer shell. So that to get to those you have to fill, for example, the 6S and then you drop back to the 4S. 
to fill and that you may fill the 7S and then you drop back and fill the 5F so that the Fs, the inner transition elements, are two shells removed from the outer shell. Progression of properties. This is a really important section. Let's look at it. Let's start with metallic character. Then we'll talk about relative sizes of atoms. Talk about what is meant by an electronic, an isoelectronic series. We'll discuss first ionization potential and, and briefly mention second ionization potential. And we'll talk about electron affinity. Metals. Remember metals? In Unit 2, we talked about metals being shiny and ductile and malleable, that they were good conductors of heat and electricity, and as a rule, they were solids at room temperature, except, of course, well, the common one that you know of is mercury. Well, there are a couple of other things that we need to add to our list of properties. We need to mention that metals tend to form cations and tend to have ionic bonding when reacting with elements of non-metal character. They tend to form basic oxides. So they tend to form cations and ionic bonds, and they tend to form basic oxides. Shiny, ductile, malleable, good conductors, usually solids, tend to form cations and ionic bonds. Here are the metals highlighted in blue. Now, how does metallic character change? Well, Remember, we've got the, the separation right here of metals and nonmetals. Now, metallic character increases. We've got the metals on the left and the nonmetals on the right, and properties progress as we go across the table. Therefore, it is expected that metallic character is going to increase over on the left-hand side. The more left you go, the more likely you are to have metallic character. And the further down the table you go, the more likely you are to have metallic character. So metallic character increases to the left and down on the table. We tried to use a color shading technique to show you the relative metallic character of the elements. That as the metallic character increases to the left and down, these should be your most metallic elements the ones having the, the strongest metallic character. And of these, theoretically, francium should be the most metallic element of all. Let's look at nonmetals. In Unit 2, we mentioned that nonmetals are characterized by what they aren't. They aren't shiny. They aren't malleable. They aren't good conductors of heat and electricity. As a matter of fact, they're often good insulators. Well, let's add a few more things to that. The atoms tend to form anions when reacting with metals. Nonmetals tend to form acid oxides. And nonmetals bond together with other nonmetals covalently to produce a huge array of compounds. Carbon and its ability to bond covalently producing long chains with branches, comprises the largest group of elements in the system. Here we see the placement of nonmetals on the table. Now, nonmetallic character is going to increase. Which way? Well, as we go up and to the right, we come, become more nonmetallic. So nonmetallic character increases to the right, and up. Therefore, fluorine should be the no most nonmetallic element. Now, we've not included the noble gases in this discussion because they don't have nearly the tendency to react as other nonmetals. So we're excluding them from this conversation. Now let's look at atomic radius. What do we mean by atomic radius? The way we look at it is, it's half the distance between atomic nuclei 
when they have bonded together, like this. We have a diatomic element, maybe diatomic fluorine. Then the atomic radius is half the distance between the atomic nuclei. And this distance will, of course, vary depending on su such circumstances as the state of matter and other conditions. As we look at this, the atomic radius is going to increase which way? Well, it's going to increase to the left, and it's going to increase going down. Now, I'm sure you agree with the increasing going down, but do you understand why it increases to the left? And on this basis, then, francium, which is theoretically the most metallic element, should also be the largest element. Why does radius increase down the table? Well, it's really kind of intuitively obvious. Here you have the nucleus and the first orbital. The second orbital, which is the second period now, is further out. The third orbital is further out yet, and so the atom is getting larger. The fourth orbital is further out yet, and so we go. Now, look at the question, why does radius decrease, decrease across the table? I mean, after all, as you go across the table, you've got more electrons, yeah. But let's look at something else. Let's look at this series. Sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine. We're saying that as you go across the table, instead of getting larger, the atoms get smaller. Well, let's look at the, let's look at the number of protons. Sodium has 11 protons. Okay. And where is sodium's last electron? It's right here. That electron feels the pull of 11 protons. Here's magnesium, 12 protons. Both of those electrons out there feel the pull of all 12 protons. Aluminum, 13 protons. Sure, it has three electrons out there, but an electron doesn't say, back off, buddy, that's my proton. Those electrons feel the pull of all of those protons. And with silicon, with four. And phosphorus, with five. And sulfur, with six electrons. And chlorine, with seven. And so those electrons are being pulled closer and closer and closer to the nucleus as the size of the nuclear charge increases. Let's look at an isoelectronic series. An isoelectronic series is a series of atoms or ions having the same number of electrons. In other words, the same electron configuration. Let's look at the sulfide ion. The sulfide ion has 18 electrons. And let's look at a series and see what form of each of that series would be isoelectronic with the sulfide ion. Now, here we go. This is the series. Aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. Well, the sulfur has 18 electrons. Aluminum would have to be a negative 5. Silicon, a negative 4. Phosphorus, a negative 3. To be isoelectronic with sulfur with its negative 2. Chlorine with a negative one, and argon would have 18 out there, 18 electrons. This is what they would have to have in order for each one to be isoelectronic with the sulfide ion. Now remember, aluminum has 13 protons, and it had 13 electrons, but to be isoelectronic, it had to gain five electrons. Silicon has 14 protons, and it had 14 electrons, but to be isoelectronic with this group, it had to gain four electrons. Phosphorus has 15 protons. It had 15 electrons at the outset, but it had to gain three more. You got the idea? So as we go across, now which one will have the largest radius and why? 
Well, think about the fact that even though you've increased the number of electrons, you have not increased the number of what? You've not increased the number of protons. So you're talking about holding electrons, 18 electrons. Which is better able to do it, aluminum or argon? Well, argon's definitely better able to do it. There are 18 protons pulling on those 18 electrons. And those electrons are repelling each other. So the aluminum cannot hold them as tightly. And since the aluminum cannot hold them as tightly, it is going to have to have the largest radius. That's right. First ionization potential. Now, first ionization potential is the energy needed to remove the most loosely held electron from a neutral atom. Think of it as the energy needed to remove the last electron coming in to make an atom neutral. The lower the ionization energy, the more easily a positive ion is formed. Well, think of it this way. The, more, the easier it is to take away that electron, the lower the ionization energy. And what you look at is stabilizing or destabilizing effects of removing an electron. Let's look at hydrogen through potassium. Here we're plotting energy on the left against atomic number at the bottom. Now, you see X. Here's hydrogen with 1s1. This is hydrogen's first ionization potential. It's at this point on the energy diagram. That's the energy required to remove that electron from the 1s orbital. Now let's look at helium. Helium has 1s2. The second electron is, is much harder to remove for helium. Why? Because it's the electron that filled up everything. It's the, the electron, the second electron in a, in a matched pair, if you will. So the energy required to get that electron away is significantly higher. Let's go now to lithium. Lithium's outer electron is the 2s1. Oh, that's an easy electron to take away. And as a result, the energy, the first ionization potential, is very low. The, to have a low first ionization potential doesn't mean it's not going to ionize. It means it doesn't take much to make it ionize. Here's beryllium, 2s2, and you want to take away that second electron of the 2s? It's going to cost you a little bit more to get it. Boron? Boron, you want to remove the 2px, 1. Well, okay. It'll be easier to remove than beryllium's, but not that easy. And carbon, you want to remove the py. Nitrogen, it's getting higher, the PZ. You've got a half-filled orbital here. Each one of those orientations is half-filled. The entire orbital is half-filled. It is going to take more energy to remove one of those electrons because, remember, it seems that there is a certain stability that goes with being filled, half-filled, or empty. And here's oxygen. Look, it has two electrons in the PX. And fluorine is similar in that regard to oxygen. And neon, of course we expect neon to be high. Look, everything is full. It doesn't want to lose one of those electrons. That's one of the reasons it's so very stable. Now, what's next on our list? Sodium. What do you think is going to happen with sodium's first ionization potential? I'm asking before we get there. Are you ready? This is what it looks like. Look how low that first ionization potential is. Stand around for a while and sodium will give you that electron. A very low first ionization potential. Magnesium, a little higher. Aluminum drops back a bit. Silicon comes up. 
Phosphorus comes up yet again. Look, it's paralleling the previous line. Drops down for sulfur. Comes up for chlorine, just like it did for fluorine. And now we're up high for argon. Okay, what's going to happen then with the next one? The next one is potassium. What is your prediction? Look at where lithium is. Look at where sodium is. Where do you expect potassium to be? Right there. Very low first ionization potential. Here is something for you to think about. If the second ionization potential or the second ionization energy is the energy needed to remove another electron after the first has already been removed, what would the second ionization energy diagram look like? Try to plot one out through sodium. Let's look now at electron affinity. Electron affinity is the enthalpy change that occurs when an electron is added to a neutral atom or to an ion. Think about it now. You're going to take a neutral atom or an ion and you're going to have it take on an additional electron. What is the enthalpy change that's going to be needed there? Usually some energy is given off when an, an electron is added, but the exceptions, the exceptions are really important. Let's look at a table real quick. Here's a table of electron affinities. Have you had an opportunity to get a good look at it? Well, I want you to think of it like this. Look at fluorine. Fluorine atom gaining an electron is going to form the fluoride ion. We're all in the gaseous state. And the delta H is minus 322 kilojoules per mole. So when, when the fluorine atom takes on the electron, it's going to give off energy. It is going to become more stable. Okay. So look at lithium. Lithium will become a little more stable when it takes on another electron. Look at beryllium, theoretically. Beryllium, 1s2, 2s2, and you want to take, give it another electron. That means it's got to form the 2p. It's going to have to have energy to put it in the situation to do that. That's why it has a positive enthalpy there. So which element, which element has the highest electron affinity? In other words, which one is going to most readily take on an additional electron? And the answer is chlorine. Is that surprising? Were you thinking that fluorine should be the one? Well, I will remind you that chlorine is larger. It has a very, very strong affinity for electrons. It has m a larger nucleus that can handle it. Bromine would be getting too far out with it when the electron comes in. Chlorine seems to have all the right combination of circumstances. So the element with the highest electron affinity is chlorine. Imagine an anion gaining another electron. Do you see then why its electron affinity would have a positive value? For example, if we have an oxygen atom and it takes on an electron, its delta H is going to be minus 141 kilojoules per mole. It's going to take an electron and give you energy. But if you take that oxygen ion and you ask it to take on an electron to form the O2, the energy requirement is going to be 880 kilojoules per mole. You've got to give it that much energy for it to take on that additional electron. Why? Did you tell me 
that the reason that is positive is the repulsion that you get from this electron and this anion is such that it requires a lot of energy to overcome the electrostatic repulsion? Sure, that's exactly right. And you're going to find this to be typical of, of anions. When you try to have them take on an extra electron, the delta H will have a positive value. In covering this unit, we looked at some historical aspects of the periodic table. We talked about its organization and we were able to use position on the table to determine electron configurations. We talked about the types of elements and then we mentioned the all-important progression of properties. That's a lot of material and a lot of information from the periodic table. A better way to teach and learn chemistry.